During the 2016 American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting, Duke Eye Center held educational presentations in our exhibit booth. We hope you enjoy watching the faculty sharing the latest in ophthalmology. Good morning, everybody, in the beautiful city of Chicago. I used to be a local a few years ago, so it's very nice to be back and welcome. My topic is on dry age-related macular degeneration, and we'll talk about biomarkers and clinical trials. It's my area of great interest clinically and research-wise. I'm at Duke. I am an assistant professor in the retinal service, retinal division of ophthalmology, and I also work for the Duke Reading Center as director of grading. So we're in charge of interpreting images, establishing protocols for clinical trials on retinal diseases, mainly with a focus on dry AMD, but other maculopathies and retinal degenerative diseases. My focus is particularly functional biomarkers, uh, microperimetry, dark adaptation, color vision, the luminous visual acuity, things like that, and I'll talk about these a little bit. These are my disclosures. We do get research support for a clinical trial that I'll talk to you about through Roche and also support from Novartis on more translational work on histopathology, also with a focus on the stages of age-related macular degeneration. We have a collection of autopsy eye at Duke that we can mine for this such a research, and that won't be the focus of this presentation. So don't worry, I will not show you postmortem histopathology data. I uh, serve as a PI for the lamp Elizabeth study through Roche Genentech, uh, the phase two Apelis Philly study, and we have others for which I'll serve as a co-investigator. We have the Jensen study we're very excited about, and I help advise on their microperimetry secondary endpoint for that trial. I always like to start with the case or unmet need in retina. This is one of our very typical patients, 73-year-old female, has a great visual acuity, 2020, so most physicians would think she's doing great. However, she has all these complaints. She says um, she's retired now and she goes for romantic anniversary dinners with her husband, but she cannot read the menu in a dimly lit restaurant. She also sees a purple spot that at times uh, bl blurs her vision and she finds that particularly aggravating. She uh, has trouble transitioning from going outside to coming inside the house, so transition issues from light to dim, um, dim lighting and vice versa. And she's particularly upset because she's an artist and now she finally has time for her watercolors and she's complaining of a loss of contrast and changes in the colors on her artwork. And these are images we would obtain in clinics, so you can note these are nearly confluent soft rusin, so she has the intermediate stages of dry AMD. We don't think she has any uh, conversion to the wet form. You can see OCT images, and these are classic for these type of patients with intermediate AMD. So it turns out visual acuity is not the only um, endpoint affected in AMD, and that's what I hope to convince you about. And in fact, there is a strong rationale for investigating functional changes in this disease. The main reason we really need to look at these endpoints critically and carefully is because development of treatments for early dry AMD before GA sets in is really hampered by lack of clinical trial endpoints. We don't have adequate biomarkers to judge efficacy of treatments even after they become available and FDA approved. So now, as I hope I showed you um, and illustrated by the previous case, patients in early to intermediate stages of dry AMD often have unaffected visual acuity 2020 on the ETDRS chart, but experience other visual function deficits. And it turns out they're not subjective. They can be objectively quantified by these biomarkers. And so we really do need this research to identify, evaluate, and quantify these impairments. So the hope is by characterizing these visual function tests carefully, we can use them at future endpoints for clinical trials and dry AMD. So we started such a study at Duke, a natural history study with a focus mainly on functional endpoints correlated with structure in AMD. And first we funded it on a very limited internal funding through my K-12 grant. It's a career development award I had in uh, my first three years at Duke. And it was a small pilot of, uh, of about um, 30 patients, 20 patients with dry AMD, a red stages two, which is the early form of AMD, and a red stage three, the intermediate patients. A typical case would be the one I've shown you. And also we had about 10 normal age match controls. These were very carefully chosen. 
and mainly our goal at the time was to examine the feasibility of performing a battery of visual function tests in this population and to look at test free test variability. We brought the patients back in about 30 days because we figured the disease would not change a whole lot even in, in the intermediate forms in that time frame. So we really wanted to establish a good test free test reliability data for this cohort. And we recently published this, well now it's been actually a few months in Retina. The plan all along had been if we do find high test free test reliability to conduct a larger study and we knew we'd have to secure funding either from the NEI or um, pharma sponsors for this, we wanted to study at least 100 patients. The initial plan was about 160, but as you know, it is difficult, especially in EMR era, and given the longitudinal follow-up and the duration of these visits, and I'll go into how much we actually do with these subjects. So we target about 100 patients, and we really wanted to evaluate changes in visual function over time with at least a two-year follow-up. And we wanted to add additional tests by then, we, um, we, we figured out that there's additional biomarkers we could look at, dark head optometry, perhaps, macropigment optical density, add some surveys, although the FDA doesn't typically favor them, we thought it would be informative to have the subjective patient assessment, and also genetic testing. And we can do some at Duke, and some can be done by sponsors. So one of the first endpoints we wanted to look at is microperimetry. And for our pilot, we we'll use Maya. It's a newer technology. I believe they have um, they have booths. And um, microperimetry comes in various flavors. The um, uh, traditionally used was NIDAC microperimetry, and we actually employed this for the lampalizumab study. Now Maya has a bit more user-friendly technology, especially in the software end of things. So we chose this. We're performing mesopic or standard microperimetry. There are two types of microperimetry of interest in AMD and other retinal diseases. Mesopic is standard, some call it photopic. It's mainly driven by cone function. Basically, um, we use, it's a visual field of the macula, if you will. Um, certain spots are tested in the macula. This is their standard grid, 37 points and 10 degrees, covering 10 degrees of the macula. In green, and these are numbers, anything above 25 decibels is in the normal range according to this Gaussian distribution. Anything under shows decreased sensitivity in that particular area. Uh, black shows you a deep scotoma. And actually, anything under 14 is considered an absolute scotoma. But 4 is a really deep, almost nothing seen. And the black, they cannot elicit any stimulus, any uh, visual response from the patient. So you can see a control would look like this in terms of um, function. They would have normal. Um, acuity at all these loci tested, whereas our intermediate patients have decreased in sensitivity. And I've shown you some. I'll show you some data in the areas of drusen. And we think the larger the drusen are, are the more impairment in the EZ, in the um, ellipsoid zone overlaying the drusen, the more decrease in retinal sensitivity they have. And we're actually evaluating this in detail in our intermediate and um, in some GA studies too. So microperimetry was the first endpoint we looked at. And this is a range anywhere from normal to intermediate. It shows you specific examples. This is a patient with 100 letters of perfect vision on ETDRS. We also did low luminous visual acuity, which we did um, through the Innova system. And um, Cheryl Nostrom is sitting right here, so she can provide more information about that. And we also did it through the gold standard, which is a neutral density filter log to it decreases the luminance by 100-fold in these patients. And that's been published by Sunness et al., so it's a gold standard. And we wanted to use also uh, software-based technology that's computer-based for ease of use, and also to be able to adjust and darken the screen in these patients if we wanted to produce more sensitive low luminous visual acuity tests. But this is your a case of a normal patient and uh, we also performed cone contrast testing, and we looked at their um, cone function independently for the red, and for the red, this case at 95%, which is awfully good. I failed this test first time I took it. It's so sensitive. Um, and then this is a percent reduced threshold on microperimetry. Basically gives you the percent of the spots that have reduced sensitivity under 25 it computes um, that particular index. And as you would expect, this normal control did not have any decrease in sensitivity. Therefore, their percentage was zero. You go to an early AMD case with small drusen, 
less than uh, 125 microns. And in this case, they still had normal visual acuity and fairly normal and uh, low luminous visual acuity, but they started to, um, you we start to see trend of decrease in their function. Very subtle, but it's there. It's not statistically significant, and I'll show you real data from our pilot cohort. In the intermediate cases, you see a sudden drop in sometimes in BCVA, but not always. In fact, most commonly not. Low luminous visual acuity dropped about 66 letter. I didn't talk about low luminous deficit, but that's the difference between how they would see an ETDRS at with a normal uh, normal ETDRS screen and uh, versus when they apply the neutral density filter. And they see less letters. You and I, assumedly normal, would see less letters, but our difference should only be up to 10 at the most, whereas you see a normal can have seven within about five plus minus two to five, whereas an intermediate patient had a decrease of 19 letters. Ideally, we would like to look at also a darker background on a computer screen to be able to pick up um, perhaps early AMD patients, and we did that in the phase two of our study. And you see a marked decrease in the cone contrast testing, and red as an example is at 60%. And they also had a 43% reduction in the normal spots. So basically, you see all these yellow and red spots. 43% of the total spots were decreased in sensitivity. So there's a marked difference in these patients. Here's the cone contrast test. The patients are presented pastel letters on a gray background of decreased intensity. And it becomes very difficult to a point where you cannot discern the letter red. And uh, it is hard, I think. Our patients, however, did much better than they thought they, they did, but um, it is very sensitive, as, as I'll show you the real data from our pilot. So this would be an example of a control where they ranged anywhere from about 70 to 90%. And here we're in the range of possible acquired car color deficiency. However, keep in mind this is very sensitive, and we might work with you to tailor the test for our aging individuals who may have some neurocognitive impairments at time or just slowness at clicking. We did make adjustments for that because the letter is only presented for a limited amount of time, so they have to click the appropriate letter on the screen when they choose it. So we slow the response time, but we might want to do it even more so for the elderly and for patients with impairments. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But you can see how much less in terms of the cone contrast as the patients can see when they have the stage 3 dry AMD, and it goes as low as 5%. And this patient is not known to have a color vision problem. Th we have some patients that report the red-green color deficiency. They've always known about it, and it is objectively measured, but these patients did not. So this is assumedly acquired and seconded to their disease. Our primary endpoint was low luminous visual acuity because it's a very attractive test for the FDA. It's um, easily done with that neutral density filter or a computer screen where you can adjust the luminance to decrease the background to um, create an equivalent of a log two of difference. So basically, we measure how many letters they can see on the ETDRS, and that's a BCVA. And you have the low luminous visual acuity. They'll read maybe about here. You and I will miss a couple at the end because it's difficult when you put that filter on where you have a darkened screen. And the difference is the low luminance deficit. And we wanted to look at the LLD as a separate endpoint because some researchers, and you might have seen the literature, and there were some ARVO abstracts the last couple years on this. They've shown a decrease in the intermediate AMD group. So our conclusions, and again, keep in mind, our pilot was only uh, designed to assess test retest reliability at one month. We wanted to first make sure the tests are feasible, reliably done, robust enough, therefore with high test retest reliability. So we've shown that the testing was all feasible and we did see, although we did not look for this, we did see um, visual dysfunction on the low luminous visual acuity micropermetry and on the red cone color uh, test, but not, and we, I didn't talk about this, but we did test contrast sensitivity using a computerized test, not a traditional peleropsin, and that didn't work for us. It wasn't as reliable, so we decided not to use it in our phase two. But the intermediate group had a lot of dysfunction on a majority of these tests. So we thought that we can go forward, we can employ these alternate um, endpoints, and we can look at these as potential clinical trial endpoints for future proof of concept studies. So now we're in the midst of our ARM2. We enrolled 101 patients, 
and the goal is to follow these patients longitudinally. We finished enrollment in May of this year, and um, of course our enrollment is really fast early on, and it tapers off as you go in the study because you, you exhaust the resources of your clinic, although we have a lot of patients at Duke, it's just still difficult to recruit some of these patients because the visits are long. We did add a lot of things. We added dark adaptation testing using the ADAPTX maculogics instrument. We have two of them on site. And we're also using the Macio Pigment Optical Density, MPOD, which is software available from Heidelberg. So we do the autofluorescence twice, once with a blue and one with a green filter. And um, although you might hear that that's a difficult test, our patients tolerate it quite well. Autofluorescence in general is difficult. They feel um, quite sensitive because it's a strong lighting source, but they've done fine with it. And I don't have results for this yet. We have to go back and um, get all our data. And we'll probably do it all at once because we will have a lot of data. And we're also thinking about performing genetic analysis using all these samples. But I'll go over the inclusion criteria. We want it to be as broad as possible to increase our recruitment. So anywhere between, it's really 55 to 9 years old. And um, we enrolled patients with normal fundus exam and drusen, small to large, according to the color fundus definition, the ARETS 2 and 3. We did not include any GA patients in the study I. We're very careful about that. In our initial pilot, we had actually a couple with very small non-foveal GA. That's still considered ARETS stage 3, but for the purposes of our uh, phase 2, we really wanted to focus on the intermediate drusen-only patients. And um, they are, I think there are therapeutic implications to this. We really would like to address the disease before GA onset. We initially wanted to only enroll pseudophakes, but we found that's difficult. The patients are largely healthy and not bothered by a mineral cataract. So we did allow a nuclear sclerotic, non-clinically significant, non-visually significant cataract, less than 1 plus, really should be traced at the most. And the best corrective visual acuity has to be better than 2050 on Snellen, and we really only have patients 2040 or better. We wanted patients with good visual acuity. So this is all the data we collected. So you see, we do a lot of these subjects. We get full demographic data, ocular medical social history, BCVA, we perform the Maya, which doesn't take very long with the standard grid, it's about 15 minutes. We did consider, I should do an aside here, in the initial protocol that we discussed with Roche, and we went back and forth a few times, a very robust, detailed protocol, we did talk about scotopic microperimetry um, to address the rod function. And this would be much more sensitive for the early stages of the disease. However, we did want to use Maya. Their scotopic machine was not ready at the time. We just obtained the past few months one of the first units that's scotopic. But also, we had limitations um, in terms of visit time. Scotopic requires dark adaptation, and uh, robust dark adaptation requires about 30 minutes. So you'd add at least that, you'd have to patch one eye, do the test, you'd have to do it twice. You have to do it for the blue and the red filter. In fact, Maya does not have a filter system like NIDIC, they have built-in lasers. So the whole test would take 45 minutes at the minimum to an hour. Add this to everything else when we're talking about a long visit for these patients, some of whom are elderly, they're volunteers from the community in the early and the normal group. So um, but the main consideration was actually we're in really interested in the intermediate group. So mesopic micropermetry is actually better for us. It's not as sensitive perhaps, but it's better at isolating intermediate disease and it uh, tests a mixed cone plus rod response. So we think it's more true to life for the intermediate patients and it parallels the low luminance visual acuity findings. And I I'm not going to show you data yet. I have the baseline for our phase two, but we're thinking of publishing this pretty soon. We did the low luminous visual acuity testing two ways, gold standard with a neutral density filter and once with the Innova system. And we have two levels of difficulty. We have your standard that really mimics the neutral density filter and we have an even harder level to see if that make the difference for the early patients particularly. We're still doing the cone contrast test and that's worked really well for us. We're using it at four meters now to um, parallel the LLVA, which is all done at four meters, by the way, in your standard four meter clinical trial lane. And we did obtain all the imaging stereocolor fundus, um, SDOCTs, we obtained autofluorescence, we did the macular pigment optical density. Bef we did the ADAPT-DX dark adaptation testing with a modified protocol. And that's interesting too, because we had to talk to the company and figure out what works best for our mixed population. 
their standard protocol was um, five degree, 100% bleach. For us, um, that test would have been too sensitive and would take a very, a very long time for the intermediate group. So we adjusted it to make it less sensitive. We tested 12 degrees and we're doing about a 75% bleach to adjust for the intermediate AMD group. And so, and we stopped the test after 20 minutes. Longer than that, patients have a tough time tolerating it. It adds to your testing time and it really becomes a burden for the patients and coordinators. And you'd end up losing patients through uh, such a natural history study, I believe. We did uh, infrared because it's interesting to look, particularly reticular pseudodrusum. And I didn't talk about this imaging biomarker, but it's very important. And we'll look at these patients separately. We include them all, but we'll analyze them together and separately. And we're doing the quality of life questionnaire from the NEI only at the screening and the two year, otherwise it's a bit too much to do. And we're doing the low luminance questionnaire as well, which was designed by, uh, by Cynthia Owsley. And we're looking at subsets of questions and correlating with our endpoints. And we are going to take, we're taking two samples. One went to Roche already, we shipped to them, I think, I believe two days ago. And the other we get to keep. We have an excellent um, geno genomic institute. So the researcher there, Lisa Rulli, will help us look at this. We can do GWAS because of the limited sample size. And uh, uh, GWAS has gotten some criticism as well. But we use exome sequencing to really pick up specific genes. And we have to think carefully about what we'll test. I believe we have enough of a sample to do that. What the sponsor would like to do is pretty broad. This is their list of perhaps interesting genes. And we'll talk more. Uh, we, uh, we have the samples, so we'll, we'll think about what to do. But the whole idea is to try to explore associations between inherited traits and increased risk for AMD in this population, and also identify genes associated with prevalence and disease progression over time, because we're able to do a longitudinal study now. Now, what's really interesting, and in when we start correlating structure and function, and we've presented this at a few meetings, but um, this is Sina Farsu's data with Cindy Toth, and they can generate these beautiful maps of Drusen and RP thickness using um, a specific cutoffs of two standard deviation or three standard deviations away from the meal, mean. So they produce these maps, these heat maps, where you see elevation for Drusen and then thinning where you don't necessarily have GA yet, but you have thinning of your RPE. And you can correlate these areas topographically with micropenetry very beautifully, or overall with your other endpoints. So we just published on this in AJO fairly recently. This was um, Alabama, University of Alabama study. So Christine Curcio is involved and uh, Cynthia Owsley. So what a great group of mentors to learn from. Um, and Cindy Toth was the lead on this. And I helped to the correlations between the dark adaptation and um, their OCT maps. So basically, this is where the dark adaptation testing was performed. They also did Humphrey. They have Humphrey data for eight loci in the macula. And we correlated this with, with um, the OCT and the RP map. So basically, just briefly, it was a very complex paper, but we saw what you would expect intuitively, that you have worse cone-mediated med sensitivity on the visual field and slower dark adaptation, so decreased rod function, as related to structural marker on SDSC, um, SDOCT, greater RP abnormal thinning. So whenever the RP is thin, you have worse function. And it's because the RP becomes thin on top of thick and drusen, and you start seeing basically a pre-GA state, and that's been shown now repeatedly. So it's quite interesting. So really picking up the early changes in function and structure in these patients. So it's very exciting. The Beckman study, now it's called the Stephen Ryan Macular Initiative, it just changed names, is, um, has done a pilot as well, and now they're planning the five-year large longitudinal study. Will be, of course, a site at Duke. We always support this initiative. So in the pilot, we've seen the retinal sensitivities at individual microperimetry loci inversely correlates with SDOCT drusen volume. So basically, whenever you have thick drusen, the function um, of the cones and rods overlying the thick drusen is decreased. So that's also intuitive, and we're very happy to see that. But we really can perform these very detailed analysis. They are time consuming. We do some of these now at the Reading Center for some GA trials. It's very interesting. I'll, I'm involved in that. That's my particular area of interest there and uh, we'll keep moving forward because we believe it's a very important area of investigation. So the conclusions of this part, without showing you yet the baseline data for our phase two, I have it, but I'm holding on to it before 
I just am trying to discuss with sponsors first because we do have a contract and then we'll publish it very soon. Um, we, did we do think that development of treatments for early intermediate AMD before the severe disease occurs, whether it's GA or CMV, is really hampered by lack of clinical trial endpoints. So we need to do a lot of robust work in this domain. And um, once we fully characterize these endpoints longitudinally, we can use them for future endpoints for clinical trials of dry AMD. So the next part of this is talking about GA a little bit because that's a natural transition of the disease. That's what we're trying to perhaps prevent. But now there's some exciting clinical trials out there and we're happy to bring them to Duke. So, and I did lie to you. I'm showing you a little bit of histopathology that's our own. So basically GA is degenerative atrophy of the RPA photoreceptors. This talk is very broad, by the way, so I hope I don't insult anybody with advanced no knowledge of GA. But this compares your SDOCT with histopathology data. And what we see, and it's, it's fascinating, and it hasn't been shown before, we see, all the, we see a lot of macrophage infiltration in advanced stages of uh, AMD. This hasn't been really, it's been shown before in a couple studies, but not robustly because our markers have been very poor. Now we have an excellent marker for macrophages, the CD163, and we'll use others to compare with and we see a lot of macrophage infiltration right at the edge of the GA. In this area, the RP is completely missing. You don't have any drusen. And um, Christine Corsio talks about this a lot. She talks about the RP changes at the edges. She talks about reticular pseudodrusen. We also see a lot of monocytic infiltration. So I think it's, it all goes together to show you that the rim of GA is a very hot area. There's a lot of change going on. We don't fully understand it. So we have to characterize it functionally, structurally, histopathologically, in all kinds of ways to really try to develop targets and help these patients going forward. The reason is, for now, we haven't had any treatments for these patients, not much to offer in clinic. I have two things to offer them. One is the res vitamins that you all know about, slows progression to the wet by 20%. I offer this, obviously, to the high-risk intermediate patients. And we help the GA patients by referring them to low vision. We have an excellent low vision service at Duke. We're very fortunate in this regard, so we can involve them early. And um, they're taught techniques how to deal with their scotoma that we, pick, we can pick up on microperimetry. And um, they're helped with luminance, uh, with the light sources at home, with magnifiers. Now they're these amazing electronic magnifiers and services to the blind. And and whatnot. But other than that, we don't have anything that's worked in clinical trials for GA. So huge unmet need, but I think it's a prime area of inquiry, and that's why I'm so happy to be in this area and to be working at Duke because we're finally making progress. So our science and animal models have improved. In fact, at Duke, we do have one of the better, two good models of dry MD, the very rare. None of them are ideal, but Kathy Bozrickman and Goldis Malik have, I think, the best models on dry MD out there. And there's new therapeutic R&D pipeline, finally, clinical trials underway. And what I'm really excited about is all these new imaging modalities and visual function endpoints are brand new and very helpful to us going forward. So this is a list of therapies for dry MD development. So it is a very hopeful time to be in dry MD. The complement inhibitors that you know a lot about, anti-amyloid, visual psychotherapeutics, and mitochondria targeting drugs, and cell therapy and others. And uh, patients are always excited, particularly about stem cells. They always ask uh, cel uh, cell therapy, and that's all coming. So I'll go in order a little bit, but briefly, because the point of this talk is not really to dwell on one trial. The lampalizumab phase three is ongoing. The phase two was very positive. Anti-factor D antibody intravitreally applied every four weeks or every six weeks. We're site. We're very happy to have been able to offer this. We've had a lot of support from the community to enroll fast for this trial. Done very well. There's the Novartis anti uh, C5 ongoing. There's the Apelis Phase Two, which is also very exciting. We're also offering it. Done very well with that. And there are others on the list. Complement inhibitors. There's been some preclinical data in humans that's been most useful for the clinical trial development. And I won't go into that, but all I wanted to mention is that the phase two Mahalo trial shown that lampalizumab, referred to as anti-factor D, showed a 20% reduction rate in the area of GA at 18 months. So again, I tell the patients the goal is not to improve your vision or um, you know, regenerate the retina or decrease the area of GA, but to prevent worsening. 
based on the, uh, these data. The enrolled patients all have non-fulvia GA because what we're basically trying to preserve is fu fulvia function and good visual acuity. And the phase three is ongoing. Nearly completed enrollment. They all almost had champagne, we're almost there. The chroma and spectra. One of them is closed for enrollment. The other one is almost there. So it's exciting to everybody. Anti-amyloid, we've had a lot of research at Duke on anti-amyloid in the preclinical setting. Uh, Kathy Bose-Rickman has shown an improvement in her animal model of AMD with anti-amyloid therapeutics. The goal is to reduce amyloid deposits in drusen. This is a protein that accumulates in Alzheimer's patients. A lot of parallels between Alzheimer's and AMD. My background particularly is neuroscience. I used to do Parkinson's disease research, but um, broadly neurodegenerative disease. So it's very exciting to me that there's so many parallels between retinal degeneration and neurodegenerative disease. And every time I go to a basic science meeting, I feel like I have deja vu because a lot of the same strategies are being applied that have been applied to the CNS. So we can use anti-amyloid therapy in AMD as well. And there are a few trials out there, and I won't go in detail, the GSK, none of them so far have shown a lot of promise is the unfortunate thing, but um, we'll see what they have in store for us. Visual psychotherapeutics, the whole idea is that geographic atro atrophy um, is very well imaged by autofluorescence, and we can use FAF in really substratifying our patient population. You can see up top a fast progressor. When I see such a patient in clinic, I worry. And I show them, I show them, okay, this is you at, you know, six months after I initially see them, small AFGA, but what I'm really worried about is all these white hyper autofluorescent spots at GA. It just shows activity. And this is right at the edges of GA where I've shown it's a very hot area in terms of what's happening pathologically and um, functionally. And I know that this patient will be a fast progressor. And sure enough, at 16 months, you see how large this area has become and they sprouted new areas right here where you used to have uh, the hyper autofluorescence. So we can use autofluorescence as an excellent biomarker. And the patients are substratified for these trials. Their LAMPA, for example, is enrolling patients with diffuse hyper autofluorescence and specific other features of the disease versus a more focal loss because they're trying to target the fast progressors. Slow would be a patient like this. They do have some small islands of GA, but I look in when I first meet them, I said, you know, Mrs. Jones, um, this looks pretty promising to me because I don't see a lot of hyper autofluorescence. You're not what I call a fast progressor. I only have a one snapshot in time, so I can tell you how you're going to do over time. I have to see you again, similar to glaucoma. We have to see patients longitudinal to really know. But it looks pretty good. You're, you're what I would call a slow progressor. And here they have some spots of hyper autofluorescence, but really you notice they haven't changed a lot. In 18 months, they've been fairly stable because, again, they're slow progressors. As so it's nice we can stratify and um, provide some prognostic guidance to our patients. They always ask, Doc, is there a chance I'll go blind? And I say, no, that's not the case. We always try to do whatever we can in our airmamitarium today. We don't have successful drugs yet, but I will refer to low vision because they'll be able to help early, and I will follow you, and anything coming up in the pipeline will be able to offer to you if you qualify for some of these trials. But the whole idea is that visual psychotherapeutics address the lipofusin and um, the, um, the A2A and the visual psychomolecules. So there, there are a few examples out here. There's Acucella, which Scott Cousins talked about yesterday on the retina subspecialty day. And there's others. And again, you know, the jury's still out. Not a lot yet of excitement about the uh, visual psychotherapeutics right now. Mitochondrial targeted drugs though, are very exciting because now we understand that there's a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction in the photoreceptors in the retina. And I didn't uh, mention this specifically, but um, I, I implied by the functional decrease in rods first that the rods degenerate first in AMD, then the cones follow. These are very high activity cells and they do end up showing mitochondrial dysfunction early on. So the whole idea is to try to boost their mitochondria through these mitochondrial targeting drugs. And there are a couple targets out there and a couple companies working on this. The main one right now that I'm aware of because um, we have an ongoing study now that's just starting and rolling soon is by Stealth Biotherapeutics. So it's an experimental mitochondrial protective drug. It protects the mitochondria, perhaps even boosts its function. They have drugs they've employed in cardiac patients 
but now they're going into the eye. So we're very happy to see that. Um, they've done animal studies on cardiovascular disease, brain ischemia, and now dry AMD. And they have some clinical trials ongoing, and we're helping them at Duke with DME and AMD, dry AMD studies. So we'll be starting the enrollment on a Drusen study soon. And the drug is MTP131. It's a phase 1, 2, DME and now AMD. And there are other ubiquitin analogs, which are redox cyclers that are also exciting. And they could be oral or intravitreal. And lastly, the cell therapy is always the most exciting to patients because it's been publicized, I think, in um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's before, and now it's being applied to the eye. The reason I went into retina is because the brain is such a complex structure with all the complex circuitry. So I was thinking neurosurgeons who did these clinical trials of cell therapy in Parkinson's advised me to consider retina at the time when I was a grad student. They said, you know, Nora, you better think about the retina because that's a new frontier. You can visualize it. It has less layers and less complex circuitry, perhaps. Now we know, in fact, the retina is quite complicated. It's not easy. But we do have the imaging modality. So I do feel that we have superior, su superior techniques to really uh, work with. So there's a lot of excitement of retinal cell therapy now for retinal degenerative diseases. And this was a paper in Lancet showing the human embryonic stem cell derived retinal pigment epithelium cells in the patients with AMD and Stargardt um, showed some progress in an um, open label phase one, two study. Now, of course, this was open label. And um, there's another paper in, um, in progress in retinal NI research. But the sources of cells for retinal therapy are either from the blastocyst, so embryo, these are embryonic stem cells, or umbilical cord, and these wor would be from the newborn, so these are umbilical tissue cells, or adult tissue. Anywhere from bone, blood, brain, corneal limbal stem cell generally, because this is an area of investigation of corneal disease that's very exciting too. So we can use... Um, hematopoietic stem cells for replacement therapies. And the cell delivery strategies are either transvitreal through intravitreal injection. Uh, that is a little more difficult to figure out because the cells would have to come in. Basically, um, they have to go. So this is a transvitreal, but it's a subretinal injection. And it can be prone to some complications like retinal detachment, retinal tears. And this is why Jensen has, a, has recently modified their protocol to um, include a supracoroidal approach. Um, intravitreal is what I was trying to tell you about. It would be ideal, but it's hard to imagine how the cells would integrate and go transretinally and really establish connectivity or even trophism because they have a tendency to want to sit there in a clump and we don't really know what they convert into s if they're stem cells and we don't really know if they'll ever integrate and establish uh, physiologic connections or be effective neurotrophically. And this is because there are two approaches of cell therapy. The first is that you may imagine the hope would be that functional cells that are in working orders would replace the injured cells to really restore the retinal machinery. And you can take a suspension or you can take an expanded differentiated cell therapy product like an RP patch and go in and put it subretinally. It's a more high risk um, surgery on medical retina for a reason. I believe in minimally invasive therapies. But um, it, is, it is how it was traditionally done. Now we have the supracoroidal approach uh, that Jensen is trying. That's really neat that I think will make it much easier on patients and surgeons. But this is the functional approach. And for the brain, that's what we're hoping was going on. However, in the end, it did turn out, for Parkinson's at least, that what the cells did was um, instead of replacing function, they provided more of a trophic support. In the brain, at least, we had specific challenges where the cells were encapsulated with a fibroblast sheath, so they almost formed, um, they almost uh, had a barrier, and it was impossible to, to really go in and reestablish normal secretory. In the retina, I hope this won't be the case, but we'll have to see. The cell replacement trials that are targeting a functional replacement approach are the one by Estelas. This is the new name for Okada, which used to be ACT, and, um, and others on this list, Stem Cells Inc., as I understand. Um, I may be incorrect. But the second approach is su supportive or trophic therapy. 
And this is what in, in the end was thought to happen in the brain, where the cells are put in subretinally and they support the existing cells, perhaps at the edge of GA, if you will, that are have not yet completely lost function. They're there dormant, not helping the patient, but we're trying to prevent further loss. And perhaps induce some natural repair mechanism that might be might be going on through perhaps the WENT pathways or others where um, you can uh, really call on the natural repair mechanism of the injured retina by altering the microenvironment. So you can have neurotrophic factors or other pathways being activated downstream to help the existing cells. So, um, and you can use a cell therapy product that's expanded but not differentiated for this approach. And an example of this is um, the trial we're offering at Duke, the Jensen, Johnson & Johnson study. You can see an example of a patient. The vision was 2800 initially, and there was a patient with GA. And this, um, at month six, you can see evidence of implanted cells subretinally. And the assumption is the needle, surgical needle went here and had a cell track. And here is evidence of the transplanted cells. They're opaque, whitish looking. And the, this particular patient became 2200. Now, this was a small study. We'll have to see how the larger study pans out. I'm very excited because, specifically because of their delivery mechanism, and um, which is much less invasive, well tolerated from what I understand. And there's so much excitement in, our, in, our, in the community and from the patients um, about this study as well. So these are examples of clinical trials that employ cell therapy with a potential trophic mechanism. And this is the one we're offering. This is a CNTO 2476 suspension. Alan Ho talks about um, their injections. Um, now, not for GA yet, but it's been used for retinitis pigmentosa as a retinal prosthesis. Obviously, very exciting. I only expect that that technology will continue to be developed and the resolution will improve. There, um, in addition to second sight, there are others. Um, I was a med student at Stanford initially and then a resident, so I initially worked on the Stanford prosthesis. And they, uh, Daniel Palenker tells me that um, they have every single intention to improve the resolution and make the prosthesis even better. So I think there's a lot of future in prosthetic devices, um, including GA. And if uh, the surgical approach becomes easier, better tolerated, and less invasive, I think the application can be expanded. I really don't see why not. Optogenetics is early on, but I'm particularly excited about it. It's a neuroscience technique that is ideally applied to the retina. It's game changing. It uses um, a channel from an algae that can be activated downstream. So basically, as you can see in this diagram, say you have loss of photoreceptors in a GA patient, but you still have intact ganglion cells, you can uh, put in you can put in channel rhodopsin that you can stimulate with light and then provide function. And then you can have the visual function being transmitted through the nerve, through the brain. So you basically bypass the area of damage through this technique. I think the technique that the year by Nature magazine, there are uh, many people that work on it. Disseroth at Stanford and others uh, may end up getting the Nobel Prize for it. I, I'm waiting. We're getting um, one of the MIT folks is coming to talk at Duke, and I'd love to have him um, tell us what we can do to help him. His company was EOS Neuroscience. He's been too busy, though, regenerating the brain with optogenetics. So, but RetroSense, as I understand, is much farther ahead now. And this is an area of great promise that I'm particularly excited about, although early on. So I hope I convinced you we are finally making progress. I feel that uh, this is an ideal time to be in AMD research, whether it's basic science, trans translational, clinical, histopathology, all of it, because the science and animal models are better because we have all these clinical trials underway. There's so much excitement from the patient community and retina specialist community. We all work together now. It doesn't matter that you're in private practice or academics, we get referrals from all over. We may compete for patients, but we help each other in clinical trials. So there's just a general excitement out there. And we have all these tremendous imaging technology. And I barely scratch the surface because there'll be a lot coming. At Duke, we have our home brews. We're one of the leaders in OCT, and that's one of our major strengths with Joe Isaac and Z Cindy Toth, Sin Sina Farsi, who developed software for this. And they develop gadgets just, just awe us. Um, we have this advanced OCT system now that's an AO OCT that has really high resolution, so we can really correlate structural functions so much better than ever before. We have now white field OCT that we just have. It's a homebrew, but it can look past the equator. So we can really address the retinal periphery now with OCT. 
and I think um, that's only a couple years in the making until it becomes mainstream. And then we have AO technology, um, we have so many other things, and then the functional modalities. And it's really nice to see that functional testing is now integrated in a criti critical part of clinical trials. So we, ha we help the sponsors develop protocols on microprivatry, dark adaptation with a vendor support, of course. And I think this is just the beginning. I think functional testing will also be very relevant for trials on retinitis pigmentosa, Stargars, and others because FDA always wants to see the patient's perspective functionally. They love the imaging, and we can show them um, fantastic data, but they always want to know what the patient functional correlate may be, and we're happy to help with that. And, um, and I'm happy, by the way, now right now it's an ideal time. This is as casual as it can be. Happy to address questions um, and talk, because that's what I'm here for. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for your attention.